Okay, so mm, there's a problem with the projector. The screen won't come down, so I can't project this on the screen while I'm recording it. But for the sake of anybody listening to the recording, I am going to go over a printed copy of the review sheet. And I had a question on that. I probably did not make the question pool visible to you. I don't know. Has anybody yeah, it's gotten? Okay. Is it on the internet? Well, all right. So, so uh, you know. So I may as well give that out. I mean, I guess the 11 o'clock people can complain that I'm giving you two extra days on your essay, but, you know, it is what it is. So I'm going to go over this. Remember, your exam is a week from today. Anything you owe me that's back work plus the exam essay needs to be in, in printed form, by the end of that exam period in order to guarantee that it will be counted. Nothing that, is, that isn't in by the end of the exam period will be counted uh, or, or will necessarily be counted. It's no excuse, well, I emailed it to you, well, I left it in your box, especially you don't want to leave it in my box. Uh, I mean, a after your exam on Wednesday, I will not be on campus again until the end of January. So if you leave something in my box, it's not going to be counted. I guarantee you. So, and, you know, I'd like to see any extra credits by the end. And... Uh, So let's, uh, <coughs> let's do the, que the question pool first. Uh, I am recording this. Let me say something about the recordings. I have also copied them to Tegrity. Uh, there were at least 15 extra hits when I looked at them Sunday night. So people are evidently finding them on YouTube without any problem. But I had one student email me that had a problem opening them up, so I copied them in integrity, but they don't, they're not renamed, okay? All you're going to see is three new files listed for December 6th, uh, and you need to, uh, you know, but, but the point is, on those old review sessions, they're from semesters where we either did not cover things in the order that your current syllabus does. Hello, this is room 324, philosophy. N yeah, no, nothing's, uh, nothing's responding on the control panel to it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's highlighting blue on the touch screen, but, you know, uh, I mean, I've tried to push a different one and nothing's uh, doing. Yes, the projector is on, but it's shooting at the blackboard, not at the screen. It's... Oh, okay, do up or down. Uh, oh, wait a second. I, I, yeah, I am manually getting it now. All right. Yeah, so it's down. Okay. Well, from the computer, and so, uh, yeah, it's projecting the screen, so I ought to be able to open the document up and project it. Huh? I am seeing the computer image on the screen, so so 
it's it's fine uh, so far. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thanks for the response. Uh, I didn't I didn't pick it up the first time because somebody's been robo calling this number during my classes for months. So. Yeah, 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 all right, anyway, okay, all right, all right, take care. Thank you for the quick response, bye-bye. All right, well, well, hold it, let me, uh, let me pause this for a second. Go on. And yeah, no. sorry, a lot, of, um, a lot of stuff is going on right now. Yeah, no, so, right, your exam is a week from today. And Wednesday, meaning the day after tomorrow is the last class. So that's the last day that I can, you know, guarantee any old work. Well, if it's, if it's in my hands, by the end of the exam period, if you have a late essay or something, you know, you can give it to me during the exam period. But after that, you know, I, I'm, I'm not making any, uh, any guarantees that it'll be counted because sometimes I, I mean, remember, we have deadlines too, you know, and I will make a deadline. And if Somebody said, oh, I'm going to email you an essay and I don't see it in there. Well, that's too bad, yeah. Okay, so um, the review sheet for the, um, the one that says final examination, that's not for the, the test three, right? Yeah, test three is the final. Okay. I've been saying since the beginning of the semester that t you're final exam during exam week is just the third test. It is not a comprehensive final examination. You know, so it, yes, test three and the final exam are two names to the, for the same thing. Okay, so uh, hope that clears that up. Um, oh, man. Yes. Okay, so, so um, there was a time when I did not give a separate review sheet, but used to tell people, and I've said this before, to use the question pool as a kind of review because the kinds of things that, um, that I would focus on for an essay question are also the kinds of things that I would use for... Um, a final, I mean, for um, objective questions. Well, there's one of each. There's two different things. So, uh, okay. So, so um, I want to tell you just a little bit about what I'm looking for in these test questions, but also. Uh, you know, that's part of the review as well. So what was the famous fate of Oedipus, right? To what? In other words, this was supposed to have been something either determined by the gods or the universe that the gods signed off on. But, right, the oracle of Delphi reveals that he's going to do what? Kill his father and marry his own mother, right, and, and have a, a brood of really nasty children. <laughs> so how does he try to avoid it? Pardon? Um, well, yeah, kind of. He, uh, he's not at home, but he doesn't go back to what he thinks is the home of his biological parents at Corinth, right? He, he goes another way to another place, and uh, so he thinks he's going to avoid fulfilling this, this fated prophecy, 
but then what happens on the way to the other place? Right, he meets his real father in the road. They have a disagreement. As I said, one of the first recorded incidents of road rage in Western literature. Uh, you know, he ends up fulfilling the prophecy, even though he's trying to, um, oh, yeah, escape it. And so, so, um, so he continues on meets the Sphinx, solves the riddle of the Sphinx. They award him with what? Right, the king's wife, because the king is then dead. Um, his real father, Iacosta or Joe Costa, depending on what translation. But um, what does Iacosta think? Does she think, uh, I mean, what did her husband receive in terms of a prophecy? Kind of like the mirror image, didn't he? Remember, this is all in the Solomon selection. You know, I, I, I don't have a separate PowerPoint on this because not enough of it to worry about making a PowerPoint on. But I mean, Right, she thinks that she and her husband successfully thwarted the prophecy that her husband was given. And who was given these prophecies? Yeah, the Oracle of Delphi. Delphi is a city. She sat in the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. And she made pronouncements, presumably, for Apollo. And so um, she revealed to... Icosta's husband that he would be killed by his own son and so uh, they had a child but how did they try to avoid fulfillment of the prophecy? Give it up. Right. Yeah, in this case they didn't voluntarily give it up. They, in ancient Greek society infanticide, the killing of infants was considered morally acceptable. Today you'd be prosecuted for murder and people would think that you're horrible for doing something like that. But back then, if you wanted a male child and a female child was born, nobody, you know, batted an eyelash if you exposed the child to the elements and let it die naturally. I even heard a, a letter read one time from a Greek soldier where he does exactly that, instructs his young wife, um, if it's a male child, great, if it's not, just expose it to the elements. So he does something that at least in that society was acceptable, he exposes the child to the elements. But then, the person that he thinks is, bi is his biological father rescues him as a child and uh, and and so Iacosta thinks they've avoided the prophecy but she's wrong and she thinks that the prophecy about her husband being killed by the son was not fulfilled because how does she think her husband died? Uh, by a what on the side of the road? By a stranger. Yeah, yeah, by some stranger, probably by robbers, you know. I mean, they had, you know, people who were thugs killing people and taking their money even back then, right? And so, um, and so basically, uh, she thinks she's avoided the prophecy, but she hasn't, and it's been fulfilled. Because now, as a result of saving the town, her son has been given her in marriage, right? And so, you know, there's the other part of the prophecy fulfilled. So what is, uh, what's the implications of this for free will? They try to make free choices. 
what they thought were free choices to avoid fate, but fate was going to come into play regardless of the choices that they made. Yeah, go ahead. Uh huh. Oh, okay. Uh, well, sorry, I should. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And note how this is a different concept of um, why, you know, that the clashes with free will, of why we don't have free will, than the scientific concept. We're not arguing that the laws of the universe, um, the physical laws that, that govern atoms and molecules uh, make it so you don't have free will. Um, but there's this metaphysical, you know, view that somehow fate is built into either the structure of the universe, and some people think it, it's the universe that determines our fate, not the Greek gods. Um, and that astrology can give us an in to the fate that the universe already has in store for you. Remember that uh, argument that the lawyer gave, that the guy was a born loser, the criminal from birth, because the stars were in a really negative position at the very moment of his birth. Well, that's to say that the universe had a fate in store for him um, that he could not escape, he was doomed to be a criminal, so why hold him responsible for those choices, you know? Um, so I, I, for people who just came in, I, I'm first going over the question pool. Um, so how do they try to avoid it? We just went over, how do you wind up fulfilling it? Yeah, we, okay, we've answered most of these. Um, then I ask you to weigh in if there were a fate set out for you, would you want to know it? Um, Oedipus is portrayed as wanting to know. I mean, even if it's bad, he wants to know. Uh, and, 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 you know, they, they get inklings that the prophecy may have been fulfilled after all, you know. And, uh, but, but, Iacosta would rather not know, so that's the reason for the last sentence. Okay, so that's uh, weighing in on number one, and, and we'll say a little bit more about it uh, on the review sheet. Um, again, a week from today, your final, uh, buy your scan Scantron if you haven't already done so. And um, I'll, even though I'll have some pencils, you might want to bring a good number two pencil because sometimes mine get a little, you know, funky in the erasers when they get used a number of times. Uh, I, I'm going to skip two, but here you can talk about fate as it relates to our modern society, you know? I mean, if we look at the ravens, uh, you know, more injuries than anyone else. Uh, we've lost some really weird games. You, you can almost think that it was fated that we just weren't going to go anywhere this year. Uh, yeah, you know, yesterday they score two touchdowns in 20 seconds. I, I kind of like Matt Schaub because he was... He was graduated from where I went to graduate school, the University of Virginia, and I've been kind of, I kind of follow him, but it has been, you know, the knock against him is that he uh, throws too many pick sixes, interceptions that end up in a, an immediate touchdown by the other side, and so I, I hate it to see what happens Sunday. But, you, you know, but um, somebody might tend to say, well, boy, you know, I mean, I mean, teams that are having really good seasons think, man, we are, I, I think it happened that way in baseball this past year. They think, man, we are the team of destiny this year. Well, that's to say, hey, you know, 
nobody's going to knock us out of winning the World Series. We're destined to do it. Um, but I ask you from a contemporary perspective to weigh in on that uh, notion. There's a number of ways you can answer number two. Number three, well, who are the hard determinists we looked at? Well, <coughs> a little bit about Laplace, right? Um, and then uh, De Holbach, that reading. Now, I don't have a separate um, review session part on De Holbach. I, I think I have a little bit in there. You know, but you might review the basics. That's, that's why I say highlight stuff. The purpose of highlighting stuff is three or four weeks from the time you highlighted it, you don't have to go read the whole piece over again to know what were the important points. When you have limited study time, and that's only one of the things you have to study, namely the de Holbach reading, you can go back and look over your highlighting and, and you review the main points. You know, that's the whole point of highlighting it, is not for today, but for a month from today, uh, you know, so you can review it in a quick way. So, anyway, um, and if I have time, maybe Wednesday we'll go over that. So we have class on Wednesday, and it is the last day of class. So how would the hard determinist reply to each of the following criticism? When I make a choice, I could have chosen differently. Well, um, here I guess I'm highlighting at the fact that for hard determinism, all of our actions are utterly determined by prior causes. And um, a past causal history will only result in one future choice by a person, you know. In other words, if they think they're deliberating between A and B, they really don't have a choice. Um, so for hard determinists like the Holbach, this inner feeling we have, this inner conviction that we're making real choices is just an illusion. We're kidding ourselves. You know, so, I mean, that's the way to uh, answer that. Let me uh, get a roll. Um, And it would be nice to say something about Pearl Harbor, but you know, um, for my parents' generation, that was their 9/11, or you, maybe the better truth is the other way around, or Kennedy assassination. People in my generation know exactly where we were when we received the news that President Kennedy had been shot. People, well, you're. You were pretty young in 2001, but, um, you know, people, many people walking the streets nowadays know exactly where they were when they heard the news about the towers in New York. But for my parents' generation, they all knew exactly where they were when they got the news about D-Day. Um, you know. So... On December 7th, 19, what, 41, a day which will live in infamy. So, it would be nice if we could discuss that more, but I think we need to just kind of do this. But um, So, when I make a choice I could have chosen differently is just an illusion. So, the hard determinist take on the strong inner conviction we have that we make free choices is that it's just an illusion. And hard determinists are incompatibilists. That is, 
they believe that the view that our choices are determined by the laws of nature is incompatible with the claim that we have enough free will for moral responsibility. Uh, so, to move on, B, the fact that I have to deliberate before making the decision proves that I am not determined. Well, here again, um, they think that if I deliberated and I chose B, the, my past causal history was such that I was determined by the laws of nature to choose B and that I was only, again, kidding myself when I thought I was deliberating and A was a live option. It was never a live option for me. Um, you know, again, so deliberation, um, you know, what we think is the fact that we can genuinely deliberate and choose one of two options is an illusion. We never had more than one option open to us. Um, likewise, it is impossible to predict another person's behavior. Sometimes there's an argument for libertarianism, the view that we have genuine free choices that aren't constrained by anything um, from the fact that we can't predict our behavior in the way that we can what's going to happen to this coffee if I leave it here. Uh, you know, we know what the laws of nature are going to do to the cup of coffee, right? You know, it's going to seek room temperature. You all learn that in physics. But um, <coughs> but you can say, well, why can't we predict our behavior? And who's predicting our behavior? Well, we can't because presumably we don't have enough information. We don't know all of the positions of the molecules in the universe leading up to somebody's choice. We don't know all the, you know, causal factors then that are going to weigh on them, um, you know, whether it be environmental or sociological or, um, you know, genetic. Um, and plus, even if we did know all those things, we wouldn't be able necessarily to make the right calculations to figure out what's going to be the positions of the molecules three hours from now this afternoon. But in principle, the universe is such for the hard determinants that we could do this if we had enough information. And the point of Laplace's demon is to postulate a hypothetical creature that has all the information we don't, that has enough information to predict the precise position of all the atoms in the universe three hours from now, including the atoms that make you up and knows about all of your causal past and is a lightning fast calculator. You know, if we did this today rather than hundreds of years ago when Laplace gave us the example, he would probably, instead of bringing in this demonic creature, uh, bring in a supercomputer, you know. Uh, so the point is, if the hard determinist is right, Laplace's demon could predict. Well, it would be as easy for him to predict what we're going to do this afternoon as it is uh, for us to predict what's going to happen with this cup of coffee. Because it has all the knowledge about the state of the universe and can make all the necessary required calculations to figure out the position of atoms and molecules in the future. So, so this, um, this claim that the fact that you can't predict our actions 
shows that determinism is false, um, you know, can be answered by saying, well, just because we can't doesn't mean that Laplace's demon couldn't or the right kind of supercomputer, um, you know. So that would be kind of a, a response to see. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to, uh, you know, upset somebody's world over there. That everybody goes, Why? Are you kidding me? <laughs> no. Uh, okay. So number four, again, if you have questions, well, uh, here again, if you want to do a little research, I mean, I think there's a, a selection in your book about Loeb and Leopold. Um, we went over it. You can find tons of stuff out there. Um, but let's suppose that researching them, you know, and, and, and objectively they really could find out that these two young men really wanted to plan the perfect murder, okay? They really wanted to do that. Um, you know, that's not just speculation. Uh, should we agree with compatibilists that if they committed the crime because they wanted to do it, then they therefore acted freely in doing so and should be held fully responsible, both legally and morally, for what they did? even to the point of getting the death penalty. Well, of course, in order to answer a question like four, you want to give some background about compatibilism. And um, the traditional view of compatibilism, and, and I'm sorry, it, it, there's a cryptic, just to mention that, um, under compatibilism, You'll see in the review sheet that I refer to it as TC. I'm sorry, that's from a text uh, we used about five or six years ago at UVA. Actually, I use it more than one semester. Not UVA, but uh, at CCBC. That means traditional compatibilism. That means the kind of compatibilism we discussed, OK? There's a more subtle uh, form of compatibilism, um, you know, that, that we're not going to worry about. But for where it says TC, just read regular compatible. Now, traditional compatibilism um, makes determinism by the laws of nature compatible with moral responsibility by effectively tweaking the definition of moral responsibility. Okay? Um, what they say is, even if all of our actions are determined, and we really, given prior causes, we really had to choose B if that was what we chose. Nonetheless, we can make a distinction between actions that we're morally and legally responsible for, or at least that should be legally responsible for, versus actions that were not free by saying basically that actions that we perform, um, so do you, uh, excuse, excuse me, uh, did, do you want to stop by the office after noon? Because I, was it today you needed? Oh, Wednesday. Okay, okay, that's good. Uh, okay, okay, yeah. Preferably as as early as possible, um, s since I might, you know, because I don't know. Uh, uh, well, okay. Well, I have class Wednesday from eleven to twelve, but any time like afternoon, I've been six twenty-seven. You know, I know you need to do it. I, I just wanted to catch you. Uh, to make sure we were on the same page on that. Okay. Okay, back back to um, Leopold Loeb here. So, compatibilists say, if we were not coerced by some external pressure, 
threat of physical violence, threat of losing our job. If what we did was what we really desired to do, then for a compatibilist, we acted freely. In other words, I, I really desired to go get a cup of coffee on the way down here, uh, you know, by the coffee pot in the department. Um, I did what I desired to do, and for a compatibilist, that's all. That's all that's necessary for moral and legal responsibility. And so the compatibilist would say, hey, if these guys wanted to do that, and they were following out a plan that they wanted to execute, to plan and execute the perfect murder, um, then they should be held responsible and Clarence Darrow is wrong. But Darrow is not arguing from a compatibilist position. He's arguing from a hard determinist incompatibilist position. Um, but I in other words, how, how does determinism figure into this if I'm doing what I desire? Well, determinists, both thought determinists who are, um, you know, compatibilists, and hard determinists, incompatibilists, would say, my desires are determined by past events. In other words, Murawski, had you, had you not made yourself into a coffee drinker along the way, you wouldn't have desired to pick up a cup of coffee on the way down. That would have been the last thing on your mind. And so, Murawski, even though you did, what you desired to do in getting that coffee, your desire was determined by the laws of nature, buddy. You didn't act freely. That's what a hard determinist would say. Whereas a soft determinist would say, yes, you did. You know? And, and if you're jittery from caffeine this afternoon, you got nobody to blame but yourself, Murawski. Right? So, uh, so you see the difference between the two views and and again um you know if you're going to do this we we have that um powerpoint that's out there so um or should we agree with clarence darrow well basically clarence darrow is taking the hard determinist line that even if they committed the per murder because they wanted to do so nevertheless causal factors in their environment and hereditary are responsible for their, you know, coming to that point, you know. In other words, you want to totally alleviate them from bl blame, saying even if they wanted to do it, they weren't really responsible because their wants and desires were determined by their environment plus their heredity, you know. That's Darrow's position. That's the hard determinist position. Um, in other words, hard determinism says the only way we can be free enough for moral responsibility is to be metaphysically free. That is, that there should be a situation where all prior causes being the same, we could have chosen differently. There's only one position that holds that. That is the view Sartre takes, that is libertarianism. Also the view that Immanuel Kant would take that, that um, uh, somebody like Descartes or Locke would take, that, that we do make genuinely free choices, and that we, when we deliberate, we genuinely do have more than one option in front of us. No matter what, in other words, a libertarian says, no matter what the causal past, if I chose B this time, it was a live option to me to pick A. And if all the causes in the universe, in back of my choice, are the same, a libertarian like Sartre would say, if I chose B last time, I, I can, I'm at liberty to choose A this time. I'm not entirely conditioned by my past causal history, um, you know. And most people who take that view 
are dualists, like Locke and Descartes and Kant, you know, believe that there is an immaterial part to us that's not totally subject to the laws of nature. Kant, uh, or rather the Sartre, is surprising to me because he's basically an atheist, you know, which I would think means he thinks we are nothing but material beings, but nonetheless he thinks that if my choices can be conditioned not by past causes but by something I project in the future, if my choice to sign up for this course was determined not by past atoms in the universe but by the fact that I want to go into the nursing program and I need at least three hours of liberal arts credit to do so and this is one way to do it and maybe I wanted to take it maybe I wanted to take a a different liberal arts course but they were all filled up so you ended up in philosophy that happens you know um, you know, nonetheless, you know, so, so at any rate, um, so those are basically um, what comes into play in one through four, but I, I'm also trying to give you, um, you know, a review in going through it. Number five pretty much asks you to, to look at those slides um, where uh, we get an illustration uh, via the uncle who's deciding what to do on a Saturday, take his nephew to the circus or stay home and read a book. We get an example of Bentham's hedonic, hedonistic calculus at work. Um, so what you essentially want to do if you want to do five is to try to think up your own example, you know, similar to that uh, and discuss it. And also look at some of the problems, like the fact that pains and pleasures can't be assigned exact numbers, and, and we can't get at them in another person because they're subjective. And uh, so, uh, and number six, we discuss some of the factors that would come into play, both from a uh, hedonistic analysis utilitarian analysis of whether or not to build the Bakun Dam, balancing out the happiness for the greater population versus the anguish of the displaced natives and the animals in the forest. Or we also discussed that from the standpoint of an economic cost-benefit analysis. And you can work that problem out from a utilitarian perspective using either one or both. Uh, and that's essentially what question six asks you to do. So if you're going to do question six, it would pay uh, you know, to perhaps uh, you know, lo look at that video again. Uh, remember the link is on the online. Okay, uh, so we will uh, go over the review sheet as far as we can get next time. So your exam is a week from today. Uh, if anybody missed the roll, uh, we'll leave it up here and you can sign it on your way out. And bring a number two pencil your, and to the exam and your Scantron and your essay. Okay. Let me sh let me shut the recording down, so I, I don't get all this extra stuff on. Uh.